Hello. Welcome everyone. Thank you for being here today. We wanted to keep our annual tradition of meeting along with the Biophysical Society meeting, which starts on Monday. For those of you that are new to our society, I would like to tell you that SOBLA was founded about 36 years ago by a group of Latin American biophysicists during the annual meeting of the Biophysical Society uh, that happened in Baltimore, as I said, 36 years ago. The purpose of this society is to promote the interaction between Latinos and stimulate scientific discussion and collaborations. We have members from all around the world, including Spain, Portugal, South, Central, and North America. So we, we are gathered here today, about 100 people have registered as this morning to celebrate the life and the scientific contribution of Dr. Julio Vergara. As you can see in this map, at least a dozen, uh, we have Latinos in a, at least a, the, a dozen of different countries around the world to honor the contributions of Dr. Vergara, a leader in the field of skeletal excitation, excitation contraction coping for more than 40 years. I really want to invite you to read Dr. Vergara's scientific trajectory told by Ariel Escobar in the SOBLA website. Before starting our agenda, I would like, or we would like the SOBLA Executive Committee, we would like to thank Mariam Sell and Tani Hopp from John Hopkins University for taking care of our finances for many, many years until this past November. I would I also like to thank the people in Chile, particularly Dr. Ramon La Torre, Moises Acevedo, Jocelyn Garcia, and Juan Carlos Garcia from Valparaíso for taking the lead in treasuring our memberships and donations since December 2020. With this, I would like to show you what we are going to be expecting today in our three hour meeting. The welcome that I'm already giving you. Then we're gonna listen from Dr. Pancho Besanilla. He's gonna talk about Julio Vergara's scientific life. Then his, uh, his former uh, a trainee, Ariel Escobar, is gonna give us a seminar to honor his mentor and, and friend. We will have these questions and discussion from the audience. I welcome everyone to keep using the chat as I see you're already doing. Then we're gonna highlight the career transition of a uh, rising star, Dr. Claudia Moreno from the University of Washington. We will listen from our treasurer, Dr. Miguel Hongrin, the state of the SOBLA. I will show you uh, a few of our initiatives uh, to, that I think are gonna be really good for the SOBLA this year. We will listen to some announcement from our sister society, the SGP, from Dr. Jorge Contreras and former president of the SOBLA. And then I would like to invite every one of you to another room to have our virtual happy hour. So stay tuned for the, the rest of the meeting. And without further ado, I would like to uh, leave the floor to, or the, the screen, I should say, to Pancho, that is going to talk about the uh, contribution of Julio Vergara to uh, the muscle field. With this, I'm going to stop my. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really for me a, a pleasure, but mostly an honor to talk about Julio. I was told that I only can talk in no more than five minutes. So this is going to be brief and it's not going to be given much of a, um, let, me, let me share the screen here for a second, a second here, share screen. <clears throat> okay, so um, it's not going to be, uh, really fair to Julio because it's too short. But let me let me say what I can say in this short time. Um, so let me put this in here. So Julio uh, started in the Catherine University first as a as a as a medical student, and then continued his studies physics in the University of Chile. It went his college career called the Biological Sciences from the Catholic University. <clears throat> then he went to Montemar, where he did his thesis under the supervision of Eduardo Rojas, Guayo. <clears throat> that was obtained in 
till in 1972. Uh, and of course, this was done in the laboratory of Physiologia Cellular in Montemar. This is a picture of that particular lab around the 70s. And probably who is watching here, here is the place where we used to go and have lunch. <laughs> and the old uh, a club, and none of these things are left anymore. They're all gone. But during that time, in 1970, the squid had disappeared from Chile, actually. And um, so Julio had to do his work in a completely different preparation that had started to be available, which was the Megabalanocytacus, a huge barnacle that has uh, enormous uh, fib muscle fibers. So he, his work was done here. It's a picture where Julio is with uh, his wife, Pepa, and, and also Wayu is here with Ilani. Um, Wayu was his uh, mentor. And um, from that work, uh, which was done in the, in the early 70s, Julio published at least one paper, which is the calcium and potassium system of a giant barnacle muscle fiber and the member potential control, a very important paper. That was done in Chile. And after that, Julio went to the United States to do two postdocs. The first postdoc was at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Good Soul <clears throat> with uh, Toshio Narahashi. Here we see Julio in our usual meetings in the Bob Taylor house. Um, and of course, that was a short postdoc, only, only less than a year. And, and at that time, uh, actually did have the chance of actually working with John and Axon in the, in the Wood Soul Squid, not in the Chilean Squid. But the, 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 the most long postdoc and more important was done at the NIH in the laboratory of neurophysiology of the NIMH. <clears throat> The, here is a picture of the of the campus, and and I picture here building thirty six where Julio worked on the second floor in the laboratory of Rappaport. Um, and I picture at night because that's what normally he used to do, and we would work day and night uh, in in the Rappaport laboratory. And, and of course, he he published a very important paper here on fatigue of of frog muscle single muscle fiber with um, with Stanley Rappaport. That was until uh, 74 when Julio decided to go back to Chile. And of course, there was not very good times in Chile, as you probably know, uh, but um, he went back to the laboratory of cell physiology and cell physiology in Montemar again. And here we can see him after he created this setup, um, which was a combination of electrophysiology and uh, optic, which uh, actually, is going to be the, the landmark for all this work that will be done in the next few years. And, and this with very minimal resources, a lot of material was brought from the laboratory of, of, uh, in, in NIH to build all these setups. Julio published a paper that in Nature that was the first time that was recorded the, the optical signal coming out from the vestibular system on the muscle fiber. Then after that, um, Julio moved as a professor in uh, UCLA. That was in 1977. And here we have a picture of, of one of the labs that we share here was one in the Jerry Lou Nero Muscular Research Center. But then me, let me point here the, the pointer. Um, this is, so this is the Jerry Lou here, but actually, we started in a, in a, in a, actually in a lab that was not designed for electrophysiology. Julio had to make partitions in them. Oh, I used the same system using in Chile, just build everything with itself, right? And then here, Jerry Lewis was the next one. And finally, we moved to this building on the back here, which is the Brain Research Institute. And for a long, long time, we actually had a common space, Julio and I, all right, where we did a lot of work. But Julio actually had, um, we were a lab together. We had a lot of interactions. And then here we have a picture, for example, when we had a trip to 1978, the year after we moved to UCLA, uh, where you can see Julio with Pepa and the two children. And then here you can see also the two postdocs that we had at that time. Julio had Julio Fernandez, and this is Sabeliano that was in my lab. 
And then uh, Hulet um, started to have a lot of interaction with people here in, 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 his, home, in his home, his first home in, in Westwood. Uh, here you have, you see the three tenors here that were singing in a lot of meetings and, and, and uh, a social uh, gathering for, because Hulu had not only a huge uh, work in the lab, but also he had a lot of social interaction with his people in the lab. Now, Hulu meant research thing has been excitation, contraction, coupling, and skeletal muscle fibers. But now that, that is a big deal because you start with an electrical signal, you end up with a mechanical signal. But in between, there's so many things that happen. This, uh, this calcium release, for example. So here you have a, a, an example of Hulu with, with Ariel, who's going to talk later. And of course, Eduardo here is just a, is a, is a colado. He's not really uh, be, belongs there. But of course, this, you know, there was a lot of interaction between the labs. So that was very nice. So, here is an example of, of, of what Julio actually made his work with. I mean, this he built everything from his from I mean from scratch. The, the laboratory of Julio is a combination of ingenuity and a lot of work and creativity and making setups that were essentially designed for particular experiments. Okay. And, and here is, a, is an example of that. So it's an example here of the of the um, of one of the works that was done with Ariel here, the localization of the calcium release site. I mean, that in, in the sarcomere, which is just the detail of my, combining the, the, the calcium, calcium dyes uh, uh, and also the optics to detect exactly where things were happening, right? So for this, also Julio worked quite a bit in the, the development and, and, and um, characterization of how you measure calcium. And that, that was not trivial. There was a lot of work done before and a lot of different indicators that required quite a bit of work. I mean, because things were done many times improperly. Julio was the one who actually uh, pointed to the fact that many of the measurements were incorrectly done because they were done with a, with a calcium indicator was had too high affinity and that actually distorted the results. So, and here's an example here also that combination of calcium cage when it's released and how you see how this calcium is, is actually increasing in time and uh, during the, during the uh, excitation contraction coupling. But, all this work also of, of Carlson uh, made Hulu to, to actually use this, this new technique that he developed to, to locate um, um, the calcium increase in the, in the neuromuscular junction, right? Here's an example of, a, of another paper, the action potential induced presynaptic calcium entrenchments in Senocus neuromuscular range junction, and another one in the um, uh, with David De Gregorio and of course with some work done with uh, Peskov who was a theoretician. Now, here's another important one. For example, uh, it, the propagation in the Tamar's tubular system and voltage dependence of calcium rates. Here, put everything together, you know, the, the propagation and at the same time, the release. So it's it just putting all the pieces together to understand the EC coupling with all these things that he developed. <clears throat> Here's another interesting thing that actually is amazing. Uh, Hulu developed this technique, which is, he has to take the, what you see on the left here, here, the, these are muscle fiber from the, from the, uh, you know, the foot of the, of the rat, where you can uh, see the different uh, muscles. And uh, by using the technique of, electroporation, he was able to make this muscle to produce enormous amount of protein. In this case, it's, of course, it's a GFP, so you can see beautifully how it gets uh, fluorescent in the same muscle fibers, right? But this technique is really important because, you know, he was able to actually uh, produce in the muscle the adropidin receptor, which has to do with the calcium uh, release, uh, actually the transmission between the T system and the uh, SR in, in the muscle. But you know, the, this is something that 
today uh, is going to actually take off because the, the, with the cry OEM, this technique that Hulu developed may be the best way to go to produce protein, which are very hard to do otherwise. So this is something that Hulu has left as a really important legacy here. And here we have, we have Marino because Marino was very important in the, in, in the lab of Julio. And of course, Marino is in the picture in the setup because Julio is behind the camera. So that's why you see Marino here. And here we have some more example that actually put together a lot of what Julio did. So studying the detail of the sodium contact in the sarcolemma and the transverse tubular cell, and then the delay rectifier and the, and the sarcolemma and the transverse tubular system. Okay, so again, it's just putting everything together to understand is the coupling. So this is really is an incredible amount of work. Creativity is uh, the more important thing, and how they put it together in such a way that he actually had to make the setups to do this thing. And just an example, you know, of this design of new equipment is a paper here where he actually you know, you explain how to make a simple microscope that can be done with very cheap and is published so people can reproduce this result, okay? So I, I am running out of time. So what I'm going to just, just tell him, uh, tell you guys, everybody, is that uh, all of us who have done the opportunity to work with Julio, we are all very, very grateful to you because of your inspiration, dedication, the scientific rigor, and also your creativity in what everything you have dedicated to us. And even today that he's not anymore all the time in the lab because he's doing something that he's still creating. Thank you, Julio. Thank you very much. And now Ariel is going to give your talk. <clears throat> Hello, I, 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 I will need to, to, to put my presentation. Somebody needs to give me authority. Uh, yes, I'm there. Uh, let me open this. Uh, yeah, I, 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 uh, the camera is there. Okay, I'm there, yeah. So, so, so I want to say a couple of few things uh, besides what Pancho said about the uh, Julio career. Uh, 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 my impression is that uh, independently on the huge contributions how Julio has done in the field, the, for me the most important thing of Julio is his passion for science. The 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 the. Uh, Science is not for tepid people. In, in Spanish, will be la ciencia no es para tibios, and Julio has never been one. Uh, 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 I have to say that meeting with Julio 30 years ago in a biophysical society meeting in San Francisco was uh, the most important thing that happened in my whole scientific mm -hmm. career, and and I will always have a gigantic affection and an immeasurable admiration for him. So saying that, uh, I, I want to give my talk. I will, I will close this. Uh, let me see if I can hide it. Yeah, there. So, so today I will talk about thermodynamic analysis of intracellular calcium dynamics using a new technique called FLOM that reveals the molecular mechanisms of T-wave alternances in the heart. Yeah, alternances are were first discovered in the 19 in the 19th century. Yeah, the 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 physicians found that persons that having a strong contraction, a wing contraction, a strong contraction, a wing contraction, they have a very bad prognosis. Yeah, and usually they die. They 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 will have it. They will have a ventricular fibrillation. Uh, the the was not until uh, 1910 where Eindhoven. Yeah, using his uh, newly designed el electrocardiogram, was able to find that these alternances were also present in the electrical signaling in the heart. Yeah, and this has been a, a, a big field. The people showing alternances here it really they have a bad prognosis. Let me see. Yeah. 
So what happened with electrical activity of the heart during a tachycardia? Uh, usually aldermans appear when we have an increase in the heart rate, yeah? So, so this is uh, this a recording of, of the electrocardiogram. It's a transmural recording. We have an electrode inside the chamber and an electrode outside the chamber. If we look at the timing of the action potentials across the ventricular wall, the first, the first signal that happened is the depolarization of the endocardium, yeah? Uh, then the signal propagates from endocardium to epicardium. We have the polarization of the epicardium, but the action potential in the epicardium is shorter than in endocardium. So if we make the subtraction between endocardium and epicardium, you will find this QRS complex that defines the depolarization of the action potential and a T wave that exemplifies the repolarization of the action potential. And you can see that the action potentials in the endocardium and the epicardium are different. They have, the epicardium have this spike and down behavior. So, so, so what happens if we pace the heart at different uh, frequencies? This at four hertz, you can see a QRS, a T wave, a QRS, a T wave. Six hertz, a QRS, a T wave, a QRS, a T wave, yeah. But at eight hertz, you can see a QRS, a big T wave, QRS, no T wave, QRS, big T wave, QRS, no T wave. In order to don't have a T wave, yeah, the repolarization in the endocardium, they need to occur at the same time that the repolarization in the epicardium. If we increase furthermore the, the heart rate, yeah, you can see a positive T wave, a negative T wave, a positive T wave, a negative T wave. And we, when we have a negative T wave, that means that the endocardial action potential is shorter than the epicardial action potential, yeah? So tachycardia induced T wave alternances in the electrocardiogram, yeah? Why alternances induce arrhythmias? Usually we have a depolarization from endocardium to epicardium and a repolarization from epicardium to endocardium. When we have alternances, we have a depolarization from endocardium to epicardium, but there will be a point in which we'll have a repolarization from endocardium to epicardium, opposite to what happened normally, yeah? So, 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 so we have this, this re-entry process, yeah, action potentials, alternance reverse the transmural repolarization in the place that, that occur. Uh, and, and this what we'll see what, the, what you have in, you have an endo epi reentry, yeah? And this is very arrhythmogenic, yeah? This is a general scheme of, of, a, of, a, of a ventricular cardiac myocyte, plasma membrane, tubular system, calcium channels, depolarization, influx of calcium, calcium will bind to the rare receptor, they will open the rare receptor, Massive release of calcium from the sacroplasmic reticulum. Uh, 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 calcium will bind to troponin C. Calcium can be uptaken to the sacroplasmic reticulum through this pump, the circa pump that is regulated by this protein called phospholamban. Calcium is not free inside the sacroplasmic reticulum, it's bound to calcequestrin. Calcequestrin have two functions. One is binding calcium, and the second one is modulating the open probability of the rayon receptor. And finally, calcium can be taken out of the cell through this protein called the second calcium exchanger. So in which place of the ventricular wall alternance starts, yeah? So, so for this, we develop a technique several years ago that we call post local field fluorescent microscopy. We use an optical fiber in order to record genes in fluorescence in the, in the, in the, in the, in the ventricular wall. But in this case, we did two things at the same time. On one hand, we measure the fluorescence, the calcium fluorescence with rod two. And we also put a balloon inside the, inside the ventricle to measure the pressure. So we're measuring a calcium and pressure. Yeah, at, at two hertz, you can see this at 21 Celsius. Yeah, that the, that the calcium transient is faster than the pressure generation, yeah. But if we increase the, 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 the frequency to three hertz, you can see that we have alternances in the pressure, but not alternances in the calcium. And if we further increase the frequency to four hertz, we have alternances in both. So, so this means that the alternances are not starting in the epicardium. Yeah, they're starting in another layer of the ventricular wall. So in order to identify which was the place, we decided to perform experiments measuring simultaneously epicardium and endocardium with two optical fibers. Yeah, I'm measuring the AKG and, and, and action potentials with a microelectrode. Yeah, and when you see that, you can see the red is, is epicardium, the black is endocardium. There is a, the, the, the alternances are larger in the endocardium than in the epicardium. Uh, and, and when you look at the electrocardiogram, you can see that when you have alternances in the endocardium, you have alternances in the T-wave. 
Yeah. So alternance is starting the endocardium. How alternances, calcium alternances are transduced to the inaction potential duration alternances, which is the impact of calcium release on the repolarization of the action potential. This is a general scheme, again, key tube, influence of calcium radion receptor on the second calcium exchanger. So what we did was to block calcium release from the SAR by blocking the radion receptor and circa pump, yeah? So if we do that, you can see that there is a huge attenuation in the amplitude of the calcium transient. And if we look at the action potential, you can see that in, press, that in absence of calcium release from the SAR, the repolarization of the action potential become faster. So uh, uh, one possibility, uh, I don't have time to show in detail the currents, but one possibility is that the serum calcium exchanger in the forward mode is producing this phase two in the action potential in the mouse, yeah? So in order to check that, what we did was to block the serum gas on exchanger. If we block the serum gas on exchanger, we have an increase in the amplitude of calcium transients because calcium cannot be extruded and we have much more calcium content inside the sarcoplasm reticulum. But when we look at the action potentials, we can see that the action potentials are faster. So the mechanism transducing the changes in calcium in this phase two in the action potential is the activation of the serum gas on exchanger. Yeah, so calcium release from the sarcoplasm reticulum define the action potential repolarization by activating the sodium calcium exchanger. Yeah, so in which place uh, of the ventricular uh, wall electrical alternances begin? So what we did was to measure in this case using potentiometric dyes. We have a microelectrode, we have the electrocardiogram, so you can see that we have the, the, the green is the microelectrode recording of, of the action potential and the blue is the recording of the electrocardiogram. Yeah, and when we look with potentiometric dyes, we can see that here we have both action potentials repolarizing at the, at the same time, but if we, at this heart rate, yeah, the, we, we have a shorter repolarization in the endocardium related to the epicardium. So T-wave alternances are induced by action potential duration alternances in the endocardium. The first layer that will alternate is endocardium, and this is basically because the, there are several factors, but we have less calcium pumps in the endocardium, and we have the same number of ophthalmia molecules, so the number of pumps inhibited by ophthalmia is larger. A calcium alternance depends heavily on the heart rate and the temperature. This we can see it here at 20, we have those transients. Yeah, if we increase the heart rate to eight hertz, you can see big alternances in the calcium signaling. Yeah, at 33, you can see that the relaxation is much faster and we cannot see alternances, yeah? So calcium alternances stronger depend on the temperature. In order to, 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 to study this phenomenon, we postulate the following uh, uh, hypothesis. There are two hypotheses here. There are some people that they think that alternances are produced because uh, the rayon receptor cannot recover from inactivation. And we think that the uh, calcium alternances are produced because when you increase your heart rate, the pump is not able to refill the SAR, yeah? So, so we think that the temperature dependency of alternances strongly depends on the high enthalpy of the SAR calcium reuptake. The, the, we recently published a paper in Journal of China Physiology where we prove, yeah, that, that the reuptake was essential in order to uh, define calcium alternances. So in order to study this phenomenon, we developed this technique. This is called fluorescent local field optical mapping. Yeah, so it's an epifluorescent technique. Yeah, we have a laser. It's a, it's a contact uh, epifluorescent technique. We touch the heart with this optical conduit. This is the tip of the optical conduit. The optical conduit, they, they have a lot of optical fiber, so we can image the place we are touching. Yeah, and we can record with a fast CMOS camera. So, so this is a typical image uh, uh, looking at the vascularization of the, of the ventricle. You can see that when they will move, yeah. Yeah, you can see the vascularization. The, the, this microscope can be mounted on a micro manipulator so we can, so we can use it as a micro electrode. Yeah, the, the, we can use different uh, uh, optical conduits in different size, 3.2 millimeters, 600 micrometers and 200 micrometers. So, so the optical conduit have different sizes, numerical apertures and optical resolutions, yeah? And if we look at the optical resolution for the 3.2 millimeters, this will be like this. They have a, they have a depth of field of 12.3 uh, millimeters. 
Yeah. So the optical resolution of chrome depends on the properties of the optical conduit. Yeah, using this technique, we can we can we can we can take images and we, and here we can do a line scan, so you can see increasing the free calcium concentration for two action potentials. Yeah, this is a sequence of images. Yeah, and these are typical calcium transients, and these are typical action potentials recorded with this flow technique. Yeah, flow can evaluate the kinetics of calcium transients and action potentials. Uh, uh, so, so, but we are really we are interested in seeing, looking how change, local changes in temperature that will produce a metabolic impairment are involved in the generation of these alternances. So, in order to do that, we develop this technique. Yeah, we have an optical conduit inside this this structure. Here we have a cold finger. Yeah, here we have a Peltier unit, a radiator. So, so this one can be very cold. So we'll generate a gradient of temperature from here to here. Yeah, the the uh, this can be seen here, and the places where we have warm temperature, the the transients relax faster. Yeah, local temperature in increments speed up the relaxation of calcium transients. In order to map. The, the 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 distribution of alternates what we will do we will measure images in the peak high release and, and low release of calcium during alternances these are two images and if we compute the the ratio between the two images we'll have this this structure where the the high alternances are in red and low alternances are in green so if we look here that we have more greenish yeah if we have lower alternances that here that we have higher alternances. So cold regions display, display higher calcium alternances. At high heart rates, yeah, the colder tissue has more chances to develop alternances. So, so what we did was to use this technique. Yeah, this is at four hertz. Yeah, it's, it's not possible to see alternances. Five hertz, we can see some little alternances here, in the place we are cooling. Yeah, six hertz, we have larger alternances here, the place we are cooling, seven hertz, they are larger, and eight hertz, they are more larger. So the place where we cool, yeah, the alternances are larger and they appear before, yeah, the, 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 the alternances in the place where it's warm, yeah? So colder regions alternate before than warmer regions. A, a calcium alternance, but not action potential alternance, are modified by local temperature changes. So if we do a line scan, yeah, we can see here, this is the warm region, this is the cold region. In the warm region, we don't have basically alternances. In the cold region, we have big alternances. Uh, but if we perform the same experiment using action potentials with a potentiometric dye, and we look at the action potentials, the action potentials, they are very similar. And this is because when we are locally cooling, we have the rest of the tissue imposing an electrotone that they will keep the time course for the action potential. However, if we globally change the temperature, yeah, we find this, yeah. The larger the temperature, the longer will be the action potential. This is not very intuitive. And this is because of the big temperature dependency of the sodium calcium exchanger. Low temperature, they relax very fast because we cannot activate the exchanger. High temperatures, yeah, we can generate this phase two. So, uh, so this is a sequence of cold and warm temperatures. Yeah, calcium alternances are not always generated by electrical alternances. And this, this is a very important issue because people for a long time thought that calcium alternances were generated by electrical alternances. And here we can show that we can have calcium alternances in absence of electrical alternances. So in order to evaluate, uh, uh, what we, one thing we need to know is how coal is cold. Yeah. In order to evaluate this, we take images at different temperatures. Yeah, you can see that the higher the temperature, the shorter will be the time to peak for the calcium transient, and the lower the temperature the will take more time and the relaxation take a longer time. Yeah, global temperature trends can modify calcium transients. So if we if we take the traces from 20 to 32, these are the traces, we can compute the first derivative. Yeah, and the amplitude of the negative first derivative, they will give us the speed of, re of, of relaxation of the calcium transient. You can see that the warmer regions, yeah, they have larger peaks and, 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 and sooner peaks than the colder regions. Yeah, if we have this change in the calcium bind to, bound to the dye, 
Yeah, we can perform a Arrhenius plot where we have here the logarithm of the velocity and here one of the temperature of alkaline. You can see that we have a single thermodynamic process. Yeah, so, so we can calculate fitting this function. We can calculate the change in enthalpy and the change in entropy. The change in enthalpy here is 9.17 kilocalories per mole, and the change in enthalpy is uh, 35.7 uh, uh, calories per mole for Kelvin. So, so this number is very important for you to remember. It's 9.17 kilocalories per mole. So, so, so as you can expect, yeah, if you plot in a linear scale, this will have an exponential function, but the points are not very far away from a line. So, so, so we can draw a line, yeah, in order to compute the changes in in the in the in the temperature. Mm? The Q10 of this process is 1.68. So the Arrhenius plot shows that the calcium transit relaxation is governed by a unique thermodynamic process. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's see how, how we can calculate the temperature maps. Yeah. From, from these transients. Yeah. These are the transients. Yeah. And we compute the, the first derivative by subtracting two consecutive images and divided by delta t. Yeah. So this is the derivative. Yeah, this is the map of the derivative. Yeah, and as we know that the derivative is proportional to a line A plus BT. Yeah, we can calculate the temperature from this from this equation. Yeah, and we have this distribution of temperatures. Yeah, where here we have 27 and here we have 22. So the cone finger imposes a, a, a temperature gradient of five Celsius. Yeah. So now that we have the alternances and we have the temperature, we will be able to evaluate the temperature dependency of alternances. Yeah, so these are alternances, this is temperature. Yeah, we have this plot, that is that point. But if we compute all the points, we will have this temperature dependency of calcium alternances. You can see that the higher the temperature, the lower the alternances, yeah. This will depend on the heart rate. Yeah, at higher heart rates, we have larger alternances than at lower heart rate. And this involves the uh, inefficiency or replenishment of the SAR at higher heart rates. So calcium alternances have a high temperature dependency, Q10 around three. Yeah, this, here we calculate the Q10s. At five hertz, we have 1.7. At six hertz, we have more than two and at seven hertz we have more than three yeah so 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 in order to to the 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 these these alternances yeah they have a higher temperature dependency than the relaxation of the calcium transients so we wanted to know if the pump was involved in order to do that what we did was in a cubet yeah these experiments were done by dr uh, julio copelo we have microsomes we have atp and antipirilazo yeah, we, we, we add calcium, yeah, and when we add calcium at different temperatures, you can see that the relaxation rates, yeah, of the uptake of calcium by the microsome is different. At 37 is very fast, at nine is very slow. So, so here we have velocity, so if we have velocities, we can calculate an Arrhenius plot, and if we calculate an Arrhenius plot for the pump, the change in enthalpy is 20.4 kilocalories per mole. So, so the temperature dependency, the, the, the energy barrier for the pump is much higher than the energy barrier for the relaxation of the transients. And, and this somehow implies that the relaxation of the transient is not governed by the reuptake by the pump. Yeah. So, so, so if we look at the, at, at the rate and the temperature, yeah, we can find that the Q10 for the, for the pump is 3.1 that is very similar to the Q10 for calcium alternances, yeah? So the SAR calcium refilling mediated by circa has a temperature dependency similar to calcium alternances. So, so in order to prove that uh, alternances were produced by uh, uh, an inhibition of the circa pump, we performed this, the, the, this experiment. Here we have little alternances, yeah? A, a, a hard pace at nine Hertz, you can see little alternances. If we partially block the pump with 200 nanomolar of tapsigargin, this is a very low concentration of tapsigargin, you can see that, that if the pump cannot pump back to the, uh, to the sarcoplasma reticulum, we have large calcium alternances, yeah? But if we wait eight minutes, you can see that the signals are much smaller, yeah? And I didn't have time to show this, but the, the lower the intracell calcium content, the lower will be the alternances. 
So if we uh, partially block in the circa, we start Cigargin increase uh, uh, calcium alternances. And if we look in detail, yeah, this is the control. Yeah, and these are two, two, minim, uh, two minutes of Tapsigargin. You can see a big increase in the amplitude of alternances. And these eight minutes that we have a decrease because we have a depletion of calcium from the sarcoplasm reticulum. So partially blocking circa with Tapsigargin uh, increased calcium alternances. So to conclude, yeah, local temperature, local temperature changes dramatically change the distribution of calcium alternances. Yeah, the temperature dependency of calcium transient relaxation has a temperature dependency lower than the active transform mediated by CERCA. And this is usually the main mechanism usually implied in the relaxation of calcium transients in the heart. So this suggests that calcium buffering plays a central role in the relaxation of calcium transients in mouse hearts. Yeah, the thermodynamics of calcium alternances is more compatible with the hypothesis that calcium alternances are produced by an incomplete refilling in the sarcoplasm reticulum during tachycardia and not by an intrinsic property of the Ryan receptor too. Yeah, calcium alternances can be modified by circuit transport and the velocity. I didn't have time to show, but if you have a calcium alternances and you and you induce a sympathetic response, yeah, using for example isoprotelinol the alternances will disappear. And in the absence of calcequestrin, that is an inhibitor of the Ryan receptor, the, 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 uh, the, the alternances are much smaller. Yeah. Uh, calcium alternances in the picardium can be augmented if we slow down the circa pump. And finally, yeah, uh, uh, we think that this experimental approach can help us understand how spatial distribution of metabolic impairment can induce cardiac arrhythmias. The collaborators, Josefina Ramos Franco from Rush University in Chicago. She has been involved in some things. I, I, I show some things uh, uh, of her work. The, we we, we develop a technique in order to measure uh, both calcium currents and sodium gas on exchanger currents in, in intact uh, perfused hearts. And, and there we found that the, that the sodium gas on exchanger was activity was critical in defining phase two. Julio Copello that performed experiments uh, 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 with the microsomes and Pep Millet is a, is a vice chancellor from the for, uh, uh, Polytechnic University of Valencia that he spent a sabbatical year in my lab. The people that did the work, yeah, Juliana Aguilar, yeah, she, Juliana is the first dreamer getting a, a, a PhD degree in, in the country. I'm very proud of that. And she did most of the experiments. Uh, Dimitro Gorneyev, he was involved in, in looking at how alternances were dependent on intracellular calcium content. Uh, Maeda Basmi did experiments in which the pump was partially blocked by Tapsigargin, showing that if you, if you inhibit the transport, you have larger calcium alternances. And Diego Feinstein did this a faculty in the School of Engineering in the University of Entre Rios. He helped us with the developing of some of the software we use for this presentation. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Javier, for this beautiful talk. I mean, there, the, the, this actually is, is a perfect presentation to honor Julio uh, with all this incredible modification that the technique you have improved and uh, developed anew too. So um, there's, if anybody has some question, please write them in the chat. And I do have one question from Steve Cannon here. Um, let me see if I can find it. Um, Steve Cannon says, Ariel, it seems like there should be a problem with off-target effects from many drugs that may inhibit the sodium calcium exchanger and cause alternance. Does this happen? Well, that was the reason I show that some of the drugs that inhibit the sodium calcium exchanger can also inhibit the L-type calcium channel. So and that was the reason I show that when I use CEA, we have a larger calcium transient. This means that the, the influx of calcium is not highly uh, modified, no? And the, the, 
uh, I didn't have time to show yeah the currents because they they told me that they have to be fast. <laughs> but <laughs> but when we measure like, the the serum gaston exchanger currents, we found that if we block calcium release from the SAR, yeah, we cannot see this late current induced by the serum calcium exchanger activity. So 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 we have other proofs beside the pharmacology that the the phase two of the action potential is mediated by the activation of the serum calcium exchanger. Okay, all right, thank you. If, um, are you happy with that, Steve? I mean, if you both, is any other questions that are available? Let me check here. Um, uh, I don't see any more questions at the moment. There are more questions. I, I can see them and I can read them. Is that okay, Pancho? I cannot see them. Oh, let me see here. Okay. Yes. Okay, there is one here. Um, Eduardo Rios is asking the following question. <clears throat> Did, uh, sorry, let me, let me read properly here. The mid temperature of the alternance t t the temperature dependence is unchanged by frequency. Does it mean that the frequency acts by an independent event e effect? Well, it's not independent because when you increase the temperature, the the the, the pump the, the, the doesn't have enough time to replenish the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So mm -hmm. there are two linked effects. Yeah, if you increase the heart rate, you will have less time to replenish the SAR, and that's the reason you are producing alternances because because you cannot uh, re fully recover the calcium content inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, good. Okay, so then and then Claudia Moreno is asking something too. Ariel, in the cardiac pacemaker, it has been proposed that the spontaneous release of calcium through radial receptor contributed contributes to early depolarization. Do you have any thought on how the mechanism that you describe of alternate generated by changing in circa activity? Um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, we have we have we have a paper on that. The the and what we show is a paper in Journal of Molecular and Solar Cardiology. Uh -huh. So what we show is that if if you photolyze calcium inside the pacemaker cells, you can increase the heart rate. Yeah. And the, the very basic mechanisms there is that if you have a overload of calcium, you will have an increase on calcium sparks. These calcium sparks will activate the sodium calcium exchanger. They will produce a steeper depolarization and they will change the minimum diastolic potential. And this will increase the heart rate. So, so and there are two mechanisms. One is rather related to the, to the release of calcium from sparks. Yeah, that, that can be mediated by a beta dynamic modulation because the circa pump Will will act faster if we you, if you have a, a, a less inhibition from phospholamman on the circa pump, but also there is a current called IF, yeah, uh, that is called the the, the 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 funny current or IH in the central nervous system that is also present that is very sensitive to cyclic AMP and they will change the heart rate. Great. Okay. So. Um, I, th I think that with this, um, we can just um, proceed to the next part of the meeting um, and, and just give the, the batuta to Valeria, all right? Okay. Okay, thank you, Ariel. And I think uh, Dr. Vergara wanted to, to say a few words. So I'm gonna ask Dr. Vergara to unmute and, and show his face on the camera, please. Ariel, <laughs> Pancho, thank you so much for that. Uh, first of all, for the invitation to Sovla, uh, Valeria, Miguel, thank you very much. It has been an honor and I'm really emotive and of this very emotive situation. And uh, I thank you very, very much. Um, I think you exaggerated a bit with the comments, uh, but uh, you're good friends. Um, so, uh, the only thing I want to say is uh, that 
you're right, Ariel. Um, we have always tried to tackle difficult questions, uh, questions that seem to have very obvious answers, but we never believe that the answers that have been given before are really quite correct. So we are ready to attack them and uh, invest all our lives in that. And I can say that I've devoted entirely my life to try to make things, no matter how difficult the answers are, uh, try to answer the right way. So uh, I don't want to, to, I'm not very good for this kind of uh, situation. So uh, the only thing I can say is I love you guys a lot. And um, I hope that the people, um, the young people that are listening, uh, take the message that uh, science is wonderful, but it is wonderful when you uh, are consumed by it and when you work uh, in, in getting uh, to, the, to, your, to the deepest part of your body into it. And don't worry about taking risks because at the end it pays. Uh, again, thank you very much to everyone. And Marielle, that was a wonderful uh, talk and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Vergara, for those words. And with these beautiful talks, I would like to transition to Claudia Moreno. Claudia is an assistant professor at the University of Washington. I'm not going to tell you much about her because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let her talk about herself and how she can be. Uh, she's a rising star, and we can follow her example. And I think everyone is going to appreciate her trajectory. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Valeria. Can you hear me well? So let me share my screen. Okay. Perfect. So I hope you'll see my screen now. So good morning, everyone, and good afternoon. It's, it's fun how in this world of virtuality, we are now able to kind of travel in time. So we are just starting the day here in Seattle. And it's really nice um, for me to, to be here and uh, joining you today. Uh, first, I want to thank Valeria for the kind uh, invitation and also all the organizers being here with our biophysics uh, community from Latin America means a lot to me. And today we're gonna have this uh, question and answer session about an important topic. And I call it like from the bench to the desk. And it's this transition that we all have to do when we are in our postdoctoral training. And then we decide to, be, to give that big step, like moving out of the house of your parents and then go and start your own lab. So we're gonna uh, have this, this session and the way uh, I organize it is, um, we're, I'm gonna try to walk you a little bit through my academic path. And we're gonna be touching different aspects of this transition. So the, we're going to start by, by you knowing me a, a little bit and who am I and how did I get where I am right now. We will talk about some of the key factors to succeed uh, in your dream of becoming a scientist. So, and then we will talk about specific questions that many of the trainees in the audience, grad students and also postdocs, ask themselves all the time in this big step of the transition to the independence. And at the end, I'm, if I have time, I will go to talk a little bit about that black box of what is to be the leader of a research group and uh, what your PI does in the office all day and that you have to discover once you become one. So let's uh, start by also talking about the dynamic of the session. As Valeria said, this is a question and answer a session and I wanted to be really interactive. Uh, obviously, we cannot listen to the trainees asking questions that would be ideal, but we have the chat. So uh, you can see in your um, browser, you have this window where you can drop questions there. So while I'm talking about all these aspects, feel free to drop all the questions. Valeria is gonna be your voice here uh, in the room with me. So I'm gonna ask Valeria to be paying attention to the chat. And if there is any question at any point, just interrupt me and I'll be happy to answer. Questions are welcome in both English or Espanol. 
uh, whatever it makes you feel more comfortable. And if you feel comfortable, please also identify yourself, not only with your name, but also your nationality and your training status. So I can give you a more tailored answer. Um, feel free to send questions all the time. All the questions are welcome. There are no such a thing as a bad question. So please uh, make sure you just ask whatever you want. And uh, so let, let's start to, with, with the first part. And so let me tell you who am I and who, how I identify myself. So my name is Claudia Moreno. Uh, and my pronouns are, are she, her, hers. I'm a scientist. I identify myself as a cardiac physiologist and also a biophysicist. I am a first generation college student, a daughter of a family of five children. Uh, from Colombia, so I'm a Latin American woman. I am also a working mom. I have a beautiful five years old daughter that keeps me busy when my lab uh, doesn't. And I'm also a junior faculty. I'm a very active social person and uh, you can find me also in, in social networks. So um, follow me on Twitter and we can chat there as well. You have my email there in case if you want to contact me, you have further questions that I can help with. So um, I'm also now the leader of a research group located in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics at the University of Washington. I have the pleasure to lead this group of young, clever people uh, together with my husband, Oscar Vivas, uh, who has uh, been with me along my entire career. And we have uh, currently two postdoctoral fellows, Liz de la Cruz, she's from Mexico, Matias Bodo, who is from France, and we have also research scientist Sabrina Choi, who is from the US. So we have uh, what we call the MB lab, where we mainly research um, mechanisms related to the aging of the cardiac pacemaker. And I'm not going to enter into much detail on my research because we want to center now more in the past. So, but if you have further questions, I'll be happy to, to talk about that. Okay, so. Before we start with, with how I got here, where I am uh, like in the, I would say like in the, in the beginning of what is gonna be my career as a professor, but you know, like after being almost 20 years uh, studying, it, it's, it's hard to believe that you are still considered as a junior person. But uh, so this is uh, the way I got here. And, and before we enter into that detail, I wanted to, to point out to this um, part here at the bottom. So uh, when we define success as, as a combination of talent, effort, and opportunities, and I, I want you to pay attention to that because you know, like all the trainees here in, in the audience are looking for that path that is gonna bring you to reach that goal that you have in life. That can be in the academic track and can be outside of it now that it's more common to have other options. But those, uh, so we're going to start dissecting these three components in the story I'm, I'm going to tell you. And so we're going to talk about talent, something that each of you have in a different way. It's a very personal uh, uh, quality, and you can find it in, in things that are related directly to your academic life, but things that are non-related as well, and that you can bring those parts of your life to your profession. Uh, in my case, that talent, I would say, was uh, that dedication and love and passion that I always had for science and for studying. So as I told you, I'm a, I'm a, I am a first generation student. Um, my parents uh, didn't have the chance to finish elementary school. Uh, we were five children and my parents made very uh, clear to us that our path to a better life was going to college. So they gave us all the opportunities within the limited opportunities that they could provide by then uh, to guarantee that we could dedicate all our effort and time to our studies and be excellent on them. And as a way to pay that dedication that they gave to us, we excelled in, in our studies and we became you know, like these are really good students that got good scores and always advanced to the next step with that goal in mind of 
uh, at the same scholar. So I would say that that passion and, and dedication, uh, as Julio uh, said, is, is, is really important and is something that moves you and is your fool to, to continue. And then the effort is, you know, like uh, I'm going to start telling you a, a little bit about my, my college, is coming from a, a family from a low income background, your opportunities are very limited. Accessing to, to higher education in Colombia, at least, is very difficult. There are a few public universities, most of the education is private. And it, it is very, important for you to do a big effort to be able to access and have the chance uh, to to get enrolled in these in these programs so i obtained my major in biology back in colombia and uh, from 2000 to 2005 and then i had one of the first big opportunities to start my my career path and that one was a, a small workshop a week, well, one week workshop organized by a group of of professors from a university uh, with the support of the International Brain Research Organization. So this program would bring scientists from different parts of the world uh, to Bogota for a week to have like a super intense training in neuroscience. So we will start very early in the morning, finish at nine, have labs and listen to these mythical stories about people doing experiments at midnight in Woods Hole with, the, with all the electrophysiology experiments and try to get a glimpse of that science that we didn't have in Colombia. So you had to leave that through the stories of other people that had had the chance to go abroad and experience what was science uh, for real. And so opportunities come from people that are in a higher academic level from you people like my professors that had the opportunity to go outside and then return to Colombia and bring with them all the knowledge and all the passion to dedicate time to look for funding, to open new venues for us, to bring these uh, people and this organization for a, a one week to change our lives. So activities like this and, um, you know, like things like, this meeting and the things that SOBLA does for the Latin American community are transforming things. But so I want you to keep in mind that small efforts that we make every day to open a new opportunity for young people really have all the potential to change their lives. And that's why it's so important that we keep doing it and we can keep opening doors for, for young people. So uh, thanks to this workshop, I met uh, some uh, scientists from, me from Mexico that invited me to do a short stay uh, in Mexico and that allowed me to enroll in my PhD program completely funded by the Mexican government. That's another uh, important opportunity there because when you come from a low income family, accessing to grad school is almost impossible. There is no way you finish college and the only option is that you get a job and you start paying, you know, like your own bills and helping your family. So governments also provide the opportunity to give fellowships, not only to their citizens, but to students from abroad that are able to educate themselves in these foreign countries. It's something that it has a power, a big power in Latin America. And we see that in many countries. We see that in Chile, we see that in Argentina, in Brazil, Mexico, and not many students. That, that don't have these fellowship programs, um, have the information available for students to access to other programs outside. So we were lucky that we had this opportunity to go for this short stay and then that opened a new world for us. And we, we, we find out that you are able to do your PhD without paying a cent or borrow any money. And I, I, 
I am the product of public education completely from elementary school all the way until my PhD. I, if I have paid more than $200 in my total life for education, I would say that's too much probably. And it is socially that means a lot because that is what allows people from low incomes to escalate socially and economically and have a real impact in our society. And it's so important for, for, for our continent to do that. So in Mexico, I, I joined uh, Professor Luis Baca and I got in love with, with calcium. So that was like my, my first uh, uh, time I started working with calcium. I worked with the store operated calcium entry and astrocytes and I really enjoyed my time in Mexico. It was a beautiful experience. First time living outside your country. It, it's a personal experience, very uh, full of emotions but very rewarding and I, I encourage uh, all of the trainees to, to live that experience. Go outside, get the chance to know science uh, outside your country. Uh, it's, it's an experience that is going to transform you as a person completely. And then it came another opportunity that I had. I met a professor from the NIH, Dr. Uh, Shimul Malem, who visited Mexico for a, for a meeting and then um, he opened the possibility for me to join his lab also for a short stay at, at the NIH. Jumping from Latin America to the United States, working in a lab and having there um, someone that is going to support you, not only in those two months that I was there, but who's going to sponsor you, who's going to provide a letter of support when you start applying for positions at, in the US is fundamental. And that's something that you can get not only by these kind of experiences of, of joining labs there, but also by networking and establishing really strong connections with all the people that are here today, all the members of SOBLA, all the people that work in the US and that are able to provide you that support. So don't be afraid on asking that. Don't be afraid of asking support because when you want to go to the US and probably the same for Europe, people rely more if you have those support letters from people that work in the same country and that can provide some opinion about you. And that's, you know, like, my, my supporters, my professors from, from Colombia and from Mexico have been essential for my career, essential. And they have always been there and I wouldn't be here without them. But having the support of someone from inside the US made a big difference uh, for, for my career. And then I started my postdoctoral training with uh, Dr. Fernando Santana at the University of Washington. And then we moved to UC Davis uh, at the top of my postdoc when he he moved there and I, I got in love with calcium channels. I became an, an electrophysiologist, a biophysicist. Finally, I got the chance to work in the same department with Bertil Hille. Such an amazing experience that when I was in Mexico, it looked almost like a dream impossible to, to become true. And one day I was there sitting in his office, getting classes from him on how to modulate, uh, to, to do models of the action potential. And I would just, you know, I could have spent hours just looking at him and mesmerizing how this little girl that one day dreamed of becoming a scientist was sharing the same room with one of the more most brilliant biophysicists that you uh, we have ever known. So it was, you know, like that passion, that that meaning that becoming a scientist uh, has had for me is something that is is very deep, and I am sure many of the young people uh, in this meeting share uh, at some extent that that passion or we wouldn't be here really because being a scientist is not an easy path so that's why we do it and then then the last opportunity a big uh, opportunity that allowed me to to transition for me it, it was getting the support of the NIH through a mechanism uh, funding mechanism called the K99 it's a transition to to the independence uh, training grant it has a duration of five years and basically it funds your few year, uh, last years as a postdoc and then your first years as an independent researcher. Uh, it's a big support. It's available for non-citizens in the US. That's super important for, for all the trainees that are being trained here and that have uh, citizenships from other countries. Um, 
I am not going to enter into much detail there, but the only thing I want to say is that if you want to know more about the K99 mechanisms, if you are thinking on applying to it, please don't hesitate to contact me. I'll be more than happy to provide all my materials support because when I apply for it, I look for that support and I receive more than you can imagine. People are always willing to help in those things. And that's something that you have to take advantage of because that makes your life much easier and your chances are higher. So with that, we're gonna move. Um, so please feel free to, to send questions of any topic uh, because I, I, I keep uh, talking. I'm really good at talking. So just don't, don't save the questions to the end, okay? Claudia, since you're making yeah. Transition, you have a couple of comments and questions. Okay. So Thanks. let me read them to you. Uh, from Viviana Monge, Monge Galvan, thank you for sharing your experience, Claudia. From Pla Pablo Peixoto, congratulations, Dr. Moreno. I was thinking about the fact stories of success like yours are often used by gatekeepers as proof that the American dream is achievable to all those who have greed, merit, determination, et cetera, regardless of race or gender. How do you weigh the impact of systemic racism, misogyny versus support systems and allyship on your amazing career path? So I'm gonna... Yeah, let me uh, uh, thank you for, for the congratulations. I think, you know, like there, there are many things on that question. And I think something important is that you know, like racism is something that obviously is now on the table, especially here in the US. So it's a conversation that we almost have in a, in a daily base here in, in our institutions. And even though we experience a, a lot of racism in our Latin American countries, in a lot of classism in, in, in many aspects, I think you really start experiencing what, how much racism can affect you as a scientist and as a Latin American person, when you start working here in the US, you know, like since the moment you enter here and you start filling 100 forms where they ask you about your ethnicity and your race, and then you just start identifying yourself as, you know, like Latin and Hispanic person all the time. And that creates a lot of, you know, like discomfort in many people because then you start being classified as something that when you live back in your country probably was not, not a part of your identity. So nationality is something that we normally incorporate into our identity and you would introduce yourself as, you know, like it's very easy to say, oh yeah, I'm a, a Colombian. But identifying yourself in a racial group is something that is pretty new when you moved here and you, you need to deal with that. And that's, it's something that you also have to educate yourself in navigating and, and realizing how much of an impact that's gonna have in your career. And, and advocating for yourself and looking for support and in role models of people that have gone already through this. Um, I'm fortunate, fortunate to be in an institution where I receive a lot of support uh, for that and I haven't felt uh, discriminated or excluded or treated differently because of my race or, or, or my origin. But, but that's a reality, it's something that happens and happens in all the levels and, and, and it's gonna continue happening because it's, it's a long road to, to educate people on that. Okay, you have more questions here. So I'm gonna read in Spanish and then try to translate uh, okay. using the concept from Juan Calderón in Colombia. Hola Claudia, ¿cómo crees que puedes ayudar a mejorar la ciencia en Colombia? So how do you think you can improve the science in Colombia? And this question has two parts. So muchos hemos estado en muchos laboratorios en el mundo, pero decidimos volver a casa a hacer escuela en Colombia. ¿Cómo crees que desde tu posición puedas aportar a eso? Tal vez una mezcla de apoyar muchachos para que salgan, pero también para que vuelvan y construyamos un mejor país. So he's exactly. asking returning to the home country and contributing from within or being outside. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, Juan. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it. It's, you know, like that's something that we all leave our country with that in our heart. Are we gonna go back or no? 
And for many of us, the answer changes. When I left my country, I, I thought many times I was gonna go back making uh, the kind of science that I do doing in it back in Colombia is, is really hard. And I admire profoundly my professors that kind of renounce to opportunities outside to go back to Colombia because I owe them that. I wouldn't be here if they didn't do that and took that, that hard decision. But uh, from my point, I decided that I, I would be more useful, not only for, for the people in Colombia, but also for the country, because I think, you know, we have so limited resources there for science that I really think the kind of science that I do is not our priority as a country. There, if money should be invested, probably they, they would need to invest first in, in science that covers more essential problems that affect directly our community. So. I, I think that the science that I do is, you know, like more fair to be funded by, by countries like in the first world, like the United States. But definitely opening opportunities for them is, is something that I can do, you know, like organizing these kind of opportunities to bring workshops to Colombia, organizing meetings there, serving as a hosting lab. And that's something that I haven't started doing yet with Colombia. We are planning, but at least with Mexico, I have already received students from Mexico in my lab. I hosted a Fulbright um, scholar here and establishing those connections to give people the opportunity to be trained here and establishing networking so they can move forward in their career. I think that's us a way I really want to, to contribute back to, to the country. So I think you don't have more questions, but I'm going to read the comments. Okay. So from Viviana Monge Galvan, I have a similar experience and think we need to give back as much as possible to promote scientific research in Latin America. Like Claudia said, every small interactions and actions can really impact the career and experience of students. Laura de Yanira Valle Vargas, very thought-provoking history, really inspiring. Thank you very much for sharing. Greetings from University of Antioquia, Colombia. Thank uh, you. I think, okay, from Anabel Fernandez Marino from the NIH. Thanks for sharing, Claudia. It's great to listen to your experience. I have a question. For many people, getting, uh, getting a K99 is not an option to transition into an independent position. Which other options or pathway can postdocs have? Um, so thank you. Thank you, Annabel, for that question. I, I am not sure exactly why you think for many people, I am thinking you are, you are saying that because of the time uh, um, constraint that the K99 has. So you have up to, four years in your postdoctoral position to apply. And if you are out of that, that's kind of the, the limitation. In terms of the, the regular uh, mechanisms for K99 is not limited to residents uh, or green card holders, as I said. So let's say like as Latin American foreigns in the US, the K99 is the way to go if you want transition. But uh, if you are out of that window time, something that I wanna point out, um, and maybe I, I can use my slide for that. Okay, so Annabelle is saying that she, she's talking about the time constraint. Yeah, so if you are outside that window of time to be able to apply uh, something that, uh, let, let me walk you through, through the slide so we will get to, to, to the point I, I wanna go. So in the transition to independence, uh, there, there are different important factors. And one of them is when will I be ready? And that has to, that, that is related with Annabelle's question. If I am outside that four years window, and many postdocs wait, in my opinion, too long to start moving and doing things to transition to, in the, to the independence. You have people that do two, three postdoctoral trainings and then spend seven years as a postdoc. But my advice would be like, do not wait that long because you are more ready than you think. You really are. When you are in your four year of the postdoctoral training, you have already acquired many of the skills that you are gonna use to be an independent researcher. You have to trust yourself and just give the big jump. And- Claudia, if I may, just regarding another question, if for some reason people are not applicable anymore for the K99, they, there is always opportunity for the SDG from the American heart. 
I think uh -huh. the American Heart is more gentler than the NIH regarding mechanisms for transition. The, the, yeah, I, I will have to check in my knowledge, the SDG requires you to be an H1B holder mm. in terms of visa. No. Many of the postdoctoral trainees, when we come, we come in J1 visas. Okay. And I think that's a limitation, but I'm not sure. But yeah, you are right. They're, they're, the, the SDG from the American Heart Association is, is kind of a similar mechanism that allows you to transition to the, to the independence. Um, continue the conversation. So I'm going to read uh, Ramon La Torres, a very nice comment. Uno solo regresa cuando se da la oportunidad. Todos los nuestros que están en el exterior son una riqueza para nosotros. So people only return when there are opportunities available for them. And everyone outside is a, actually enriched experience for the people that are in their home countries. Uh, Whitney Steven Sostre, thank you for sharing your thoughts on leaving your home country. It is something many trainees struggle with, wanting to help our countries, but also not finding the opportunities to succeed if we return. And I, with, with this, I will leave the floor for you to continue. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ramon. Gracias. <laughs> Eso me llega al corazón. Um, and with me, yeah, I agree. You know, like we all want to give back to our countries and not only that, but, you know, leaving your country and, and leaving your family. Now that people are, you know, with all the pandemics and people have been forced to stay away from their beloved ones. And remember when the pandemic started, probably we went, we were four months through and one day I saw in the social networks people saying, what, what's the thing you miss the most of, you know, being locked down? And, and all the people talk about, you know, like having dinner with their parents or seeing their, their you know, going to birthdays with their families and all of that, you know, essential things that we as scientists, that, that we are uh, migrants and we leave our countries and our families behind, that's our reality. You know, like people now have to go to birthdays and reunions and all kind of family activities virtually. And that's something that I have had to do for almost 13 years. So, you know, that's our reality. That's a big sacrifice. That's something that is the cost we pay for pursuing this, for pursuing our passion in science. And that's something that uh, it's it's hard to do. It's a price you have to consider as a person if you are or you're you are willing to pay. And so going back to 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 the the main question. So if if you start planning your your transition to in, the independence early, so you are not gonna miss those timelines for applying to these big grants because by the, your third year probably you can totally. Uh, start drafting your first application and then you still have one year to resubmit. And if you get the grant, that's gonna propel your, you know, that's gonna force you to, to go and look for a job. So something important is how do I find my niche? And I think that's so critical. I would go to bed in, in my four year of postdoc when I started thinking about applying for the K-99. Every night thinking, what is the question I'm going to answer? I, I really, I didn't see it. I was, you know, I would, I had to spend all these years reading papers, learning to do things and training myself as a scientist, training my mind. And then when I tried to narrow that to something that I wanted to answer, it was so confusing. And I would say the first thing that helped me to reach that point, it was to write. When you take that page and you start writing your ideas and you start shaping them, then everything starts falling into place because you have this unique training. You have been trained in undergrad. And you know, like as undergrads in Latin America, we receive a lot of exposure to science that probably in, all, in other countries they don't. And we went to grad school and lead different projects and got involved in so many different things. And now you have this postdoctoral training that has specialized you in doing something that probably no one else in the world is able to do. When you put all these things together, then you realize that you have this unique set of skills and thoughts that is gonna make you the 
best and unique person to answer something, to advance something in science. You have to convince yourself that you are, you are that person that can advance that. And then you start applying for grants and something very important is having a very open communication with your mentor. We don't have too much time to talk about mentoring, but mentors are essential for your career. And in this transition, it's very important that you have this open conversation in what is going to be that that I'm going to take with me. Because that is always a conflict for many people. Not all, all mentors, unfortunately, are willing to give up a part of their research or to, you know, like reframe themselves or exploring an interesting question that you open in their labs. So that really needs to be a really frank, open communication about the research, about the papers, about authorship, because that is going to be essential for your transition. And then the, the going back to a little bit to what Annabelle said, what do I need to be competitive when I'm going to the job market? Not necessarily having funding, no? like that, that last sentence uh, here in the slide. Having a nature and science publication and having a transition grant is attractive. It is. We cannot lie ourselves. I am not going to tell you, oh, no, you, if you have a nature or a science or a K-89, people is not going to look at it. I mean, we live in a system that is very competitive. There are institutions in the U.S. and around the world that really pay attention to that. But the question is, what kind of institution you, are, you really want to work in? You want to work in that institution that only hire people that have natures and that bring millions of dollars with them. And so if that's the case, how your future is going to look? Because if they hire you because of that, probably when you are running for tenure, they are going to ask you five times what you brought. So if that's your motivation and that's the way you do science, go for it. But if that's not what moves you, so find a job in an institution that is not looking for people that only publishes in nature or that is only already funded because you want people that want to support your career, really, that is investing in you, that trust you and that like your science. So for me, what do I need to be competitive? Um, a good research question, that's essential. And I'm sure all of you will get to that point because you are unique in your mindset and in your skills. Uh, good mentoring, super essential. Find good mentors. Make sure you take the time to know the person you are going to work with. Don't rush. If you are in a bad environment, bad fit, because it's not only about someone being a bad mentor. It's sometimes it's just a bad fit. Not everyone is has the same philosophy that the mentee needs to advance. Don't uh, refrain yourself on taking risks and also changing when it's necessary. Leaving a lab is not the end of the world. If it's better for your career, find support to do it. Uh, acquiring good presentation skills and writing skills essential. The job market is a whole performance. You have to jump there and convince people that you are going to be able to do something and that your ideas are interesting and that you are going to be able to get funded. And that's a complete set of skills that you have to present. So I think we are early. You ha we have two minutes, Valeria. Yeah, something like that. Yes. So we should. Okay. So just to finish uh, the black box, <laughs> the P I like. Uh, what your your boss does all day in the in the in the office, and I, I will tell you, unfortunately, you have spent all these years of your career being trained to become such an excellent experimenter, uh, to learn to do you know like to learn techniques in a week to be able to perform experiments, analysis, make figures, produce ideas, come with crazy ways to test hypotheses. And then you jump into this, into this job that is probably 80% of things that you were not trained for. But that's why you need such a good network of mentors because now being a PI is super exciting. It is, it is a great part of the job. Now you are able to pursue your own ideas and that's awesome. I, I want you to keep that in mind. That's 
a really nice experience. But now you are in charge of many things. You are in charge of mentoring. So you have to educate yourself on how to be a good mentor. You have to teach, you have to write grants all the time. You have to do a lot of networking. You have to do a lot of, you need to learn how to manage the finances of your lab. So it's a bunch of skills that now you have to cultivate yourself, but that's part, that's part of the stage. And uh, I, I would like to finish there with um, something that we all experience, especially in, in this graph is, show, is showed every time something wrong happens we experience something that is called imposter syndrome. And we fear our capacity to reach to that point. We fear that we really have what it's needed to succeed in science. Everyone experiences that, even the people that you consider more qualified for the job. As Latin Americans working in, in the US or in, in other country outside our country, it, it has a big a load you know, a big weight in, on, on your shoulders. Talk about it, look for support. You are not alone and you are surrounded of a big community that will be super willing to help you. Um, things that we didn't mention, but if you want to just put questions in the chat or to Twitter or, or my email, uh, important things here, to have a life work balance, the role of women in science and how you get affected for that. How it is to be a working mom in science? How do you balance that? Language barriers that we, you, we face as Latin Americans. Um, and we talk about a little bit underrepresented minorities in science. And then just, you know, build your community. As Latin American young scientists, we are so, so fortunate to have this amazing group of people that have opened so many venues and have broken the ceiling for all of us. So be part of this community, keep this network strong and contribute back. Every step you move, give back to the ones that come behind us because that's what's gonna make our continent to, to advance in science. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy and please feel free to send questions if you have more. Thank you so much, Claudia. It was a great presentation, very interactive. You have tons of nice comments in the chat window. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna read them all. Uh, I think this, this topic deserves an hour of discussion just by itself. And with this, I think we should uh, turn into Miguel's camera and microphone. Okay, I'll sign off. ¿Quién es ese allá abajo? ¿Quién es ese abajo? 